Hey girl, Marissa here. You are listening to the Codepend Dummy Podcast. As a young woman, you have been raised, reinforced, and rewarded for putting the needs of others above your own. Now, in your 20s, you're finding yourself exhausted, exasperated, and enveloped in shit relationships, especially the one you have with yourself. Codependency is a way of being where we put the feelings, wants, and needs of others above our own in an unconscious attempt to meet our own feelings, wants, and needs. Sorry to break it to you, sis, but that is not sustainable. This podcast is to help you undo all that so you can stop playing small and start taking up space, you dummy. Let's get to it. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Codependemi podcast. Today, I'm sitting with Jamie Given. Jamie is a licensed marriage and family therapist, a licensed professional clinical counselor, supervisor, and owner of Given Guidance Family Counseling. Her practice is located in La Crescenta, California, and specializes in working with families in all stages of life and development. Jamie has a passion for enhancing family relationships by increasing communication and meaning to daily interactions with parents and their children. Jamie, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to this. Mm -hmm. All right. So the typical two questions, Jamie. Number one, how do you define codependency? I feel like I went on kind of my own little journey to really think about this question, to answer it in a different way. So I know often it is defined by needing something so much more than yourself or feeling as if there is that need for it. And I wanted to take it a step deeper and really focus on who that individual is that may need a relationship, a habit, or an idea, something more than their own worth. And really what I kind of came up with is a person that has this codependency upon someone else may not actually understand, be aware, or value themselves as much as they should, or doesn't necessarily believe that they have that ability to succeed without something else, without this additional support. And it's just kind of that lack of Mm self-confidence. Right. Right. So getting to the individual, right. As opposed to describing, right. An external behavior or a relationship pattern, you're just sensing like inside it's rooted in someone who at the core is, I don't know if it's like lacking, but just like, hasn't, has yet to cultivate self-confidence. Yes perhaps hasn't had the chance to cultivate it. Um, And I think we'll go into that a little bit with kind of parents and that transition into parenthood and just maybe even that lack of awareness, like it is there or that maybe someone has never been told they can do anything or it's always been done for them. So that's what they know to be true. I've never tried it on their own or it's always been this way. So why change it? Right. Yes, you're talking about A, my relationships with my parents, especially my dad, and then B, my relationships with my first boyfriends. Mm. Yeah, like someone, anyone, help. (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm curious, do you have a codependent experience or relationship from your own life that you can share with us? I do. And I want to share delicately. Um, but I think it's probably the best example that I can is my relationship with my sister that Mm -hmm. she and I are very close and we're very close growing up. We're two and a half years apart and she is older than I am. Um, we experienced quite a few different situations, divorced parents and environments that may not have always been appropriate for adolescents. So throughout different interactions and her closeness with me, she would always speak for me. She would interject for me. She would share my opinion, even though I didn't really know what my opinion was. 
um, everything was intertwined. Mm -hmm. And when I became 13, 14, starting to recognize that, oh, I have a voice, <laughs> I can say my own opinions and my opinion started to be different than hers. And we started to butt heads a little bit, but I think it was probably for the best. We had a few years where there was some turmoil between us, where we were both trying to identify our own personalities separate from each other because she almost took on the role of being my mother and my sister. And I needed to take on the role of being me and have her as my sister and not as my mother. And that was a very tough transition, but there was that codependency and just that I needed her. And she often told me I needed her or expressed it in some way that me going against her was not what was best for me. And I believed it. Um, I know that my sister had wonderful intentions for me and wanted things like that, but it did not teach me her. It was enabling me not to figure out things for myself to have my own opinions, to learn how to deal with conflict, I would always just kind of hide behind her. Mm. So I feel like that is my first true memory and understanding of what codependency is and me being able to recognize it and emerge from it and learn so much more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there a quintessential like or like bona fide memory or example of you two, like where you remember a conflict and like literally hiding behind her or like, does, yeah. Does anything specific come to mind? Um, yes. I remember she and my mom fighting and I, they were like in the living room or something. And I was in a hallway and I was like peeking around the corner mm -hmm. as they were fighting. And my sister saying, we, us, this, but it was both of us. And I honestly don't remember what it was, but I remember hiding behind a door mm -hmm. and like, okay, go sister, go. But then also, oh wait, she shouldn't be talking like that. I wouldn't say it that way. Maybe we had the same mm -hmm. idea, but she approached it in a different way than I would have. Right. So I remember some small discrepancies and kind of that small development of similar ideas, but I would communicate it a lot nicer <laughs> or mm -hmm. in a different way that just would be more productive, less hurtful. Right. But, so that like initial yeah. internal separation, mm -hmm. and, again, just like differences of like thoughts or like, yeah, similar needs, but you're like, oh, I wouldn't say it like this. So that internally, and then eventually it did become more external where you two were able to mm -hmm. individuate. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, everyone we're going to focus on the transition to parenthood and one of your specialties yes love so, working with yes and thinking about the transition to parenthood so this can apply to parents of all ages and um stages in life but yeah thinking about new parents right? Mm -hmm. New moms and dads. What can codependency look like in them mm -hmm. when it comes to their relationships with their parents? So technically the grandparents. I feel as if it's a two-part question of the codependencies with the new parents and then codependency with grandparents. Is that correct? Let's do it. Yeah. Okay. Um, the first thing that comes to mind for me with new parents is kind of the worst case scenario in some sense where parents will have a child because they want that unconditional positive regard from the baby, but the intention is to receive it in that way versus I'm ready. We can love upon a baby. We are a family. Um, but that need to conceive a child so that the other person can just constantly feel that love or take care of someone else and feel that there is that purpose in it, which there is, but it's not a healthy intent to have a child that way. Right. So that's kind of one of the first things that come to mind for me for an unhealthy codependency relationship with a child and for new parents. Sometimes it can be that 
sometimes it's this idea that this child's going to be so wonderful and they're going to love me and they're going to be excited to see mommy. But if it starts that way, it will most likely end up in a poor adolescent parent dynamic um, because the parent is codependent on the child to fulfill their needs. Right. It's not setting us up for success. Mm -mm. So that is one of more of the difficult ideas around the codependency for new parents. However, there are also more of the natural ways where there's never that intention. A child is very much wanted and loved, but also so much is dependent on them. Uh, if it's the relationship of the parents staying together, if it's the hope that they carry the family name, right. there can be so many things that are put upon a child without even this mm -hmm. conscious recognition. Right. Um, and then within the parent relationship, there could also be codependency on each other of not knowing <laughs> what to do with a newborn and someone figures it out and another partner may not maybe depending on the other one to do everything and feel like, okay, well, they've got it all. So I'm okay. Um, just that extra little bit of the codependency piece, right. not being able to learn or value yourself and your capabilities to take care of that mm -hmm. newborn. Right. So I would say those are a few of the examples for new parents and then grandparents or in-laws are a whole other beast. Um, well, let's split those sorry. two too. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so yeah, starting with codependency when it comes to relationships with, with grandparents. Yeah. What Correct. that can look like with grandparents, healthy attachment and relationship, let's say with a new mother and her mom. So mom and grandmother, they've had a healthy relationship and that's good. Um, Hopefully that turns into grandmother supporting new mother through the postpartum experience, being supportive, encouraging, doing things to help. However, sometimes it can be daughter has always relied on mother and mother feels as if daughter is not capable to care for her child. So mm -hmm. grandmother will do everything she possibly can for the newborn baby and will not allow the new mother to take over or learn for herself or to experience everything that needs to come with experiencing a newborn. So even if it's the grandparent taking over all of the diaper changes, all of the nighttime feedings, all these things that may be well-intentioned, there may develop this codependency from mom onto grandmother. Okay. That's getting taken care of. Uh, I'm okay, but someone else is, or it, it can kind of be this slippery slope and then grandmother having that codependency on the infant of just, I need to do these things. I can't trust someone else. I can't trust my own child to take care of mm. my granddaughter. Right. Um, so that can be tricky and even that can be paternal, maternal grandparent. It, you never really know. It can come in all shapes and sizes. Right. But just kind of that inability to allow the new parents to learn how to be parents. Mm -hmm. It's hard. Right. So, right, an inability from the grandparents and then, yeah, an over-reliance from the new parent to their Correct. parents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, like, the intricacies are what you've observed about codependency in new parents with when it comes to in-laws. So yeah, like mm -hmm. you know, how, how convoluted can that get? So for in-laws, it can be similar to the grandparents. However, the example that comes to mind for me, and we're just going to say a typical um, husband, wife combination that husband is over-reliant on his mother. And so that mother may enable husband not to do various things regarding the newborn child or his relationship. Um, you know, maybe that mother was always babying her son and that is not helpful. And that has developed that codependency. So that can enable husband to take care of wife in the time of postpartum or take care of baby in the time of postpartum, because 
well, mommy's always kind of done these things and mommy's going to continue to do these things. Mm -hmm. Um, but then that's the in-law and then that can cause conflict, of course, between the new parents, the husband and wife of, we have this new child and yet we have these newer conflicts around roles, identity, who does different things, duties, um, and that need to the care, the grandparent need to always step in or take care of things. Mm -hmm. And you said, um, that can lead, I think you said, I'm botching it, but that can lead to conflict. Of course. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about the, of course, like what, what might that conflict look like? Yeah. in everyone we're just, we're, you know, taking the typical heterosexual wife, husband, K mm -hmm. and the husband has been babied by his mom. But what can that conflict look like between the new mother and father about said over-reliance on his mother? Mm -hmm. That a variety of things could definitely be coming about, but the conflict I can imagine is just have the wife perhaps having a different expectation of what husband's role is going to be in the newborn's life, mm -hmm. um, how husband is going to support mother or is husband expecting the mother-in-law to provide the support that he should be doing or that is hoped that he would be doing. And also sometimes there can be that just discomfort of husband and wife create a baby. Let's just keep it in this bubble or receive support, but not everything else, not being the role of another parent. Um, and sometimes grandparents can be that third parent that is welcomed or not welcomed and the different ideas. So I feel like there's also a generational difference that our parents and our grandparents had a different idea of parenting than we do continuously today. And when our kids have um, children one day, right. there's always going to be generational considerations on parenting and what is best for child. So mm -hmm. imposing in some sense, your ideas that may be different from the newborn parents, the parents of the newborn, may additionally cause conflict. Right. And then, you know, I'm potentially just repeating what you said, but if they have other ideas, right, I'm just imagining this imaginary paternal grandmother telling her son, oh, you should do it this way. Oh, you shouldn't do that. And right, his compliance, right, that's another form of what that codependency might look like. So an over-reliance on a grandparent and also compliance with a grandparent when, mm -hmm. yeah, maybe the wife is like, we're not supposed to let them sleep on their stomach. Yes. Or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. A generational right. difference. Yes. Huge. Huge. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we know about SIDS. Yes. Back is best to everyone. Yeah. Um, Okay, so other other thoughts or things you've observed about codependency with in-laws? Sometimes, I feel like this is somewhat of a stretch, but sometimes it can also be a codependency on an idea that may not be attainable. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it might be a stretch, but maybe with explanation, it'll be helpful of, we have these generational ideas of what a family should look like, the traditional family sense. Um, sometimes I have seen clients that have tried very hard to seek a family system that may not be realistic in today's world or is what they really want and can be realistic, but you know, there's going to be a lot more steps to take in order to do it. Um, so this kind of codependency and reliance on, I need to have the white picket fence. I need to have the house with four bedrooms and the 2.5 kids, which I'm not sure what the 0.5 is, but you know, maybe that's the dog or the cat. And this idea that potentially can be realistic, but a lot of today's society, and especially in California, it's really hard to be a stay at home parent. Um, so it might not be physically not physically, it may not be financially feasible to create this idea or, and create this unhealthy, um, sense around, 
I need this traditional family and it's never going to happen. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Kind of this dependency on an idea that is unrealistic, that is kind of set by in-laws in the previous generations or my partner's family does it this way. I have to do it that way. I have to please them. I have to make sure that they always accept me, that they Mm -hmm. see me in the family, that we are doing everything that they are supposed to do. Um, And within that, not ever actually being able to express or figure out what is wanted for the intimate family unit. Right. So I feel like sometimes it's codependency on the previous generation or being accepted by the previous generation, but never actually trying to figure out what's best for the couple or the new parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, that, with the explanation, that makes so much sense, right? People pleasing is very much like a pattern or behavior with codependence. So it could just Mm -hmm. be like in-law pleasing and how detrimental that can be because yeah, especially when we people please, there's very little critical thought into what we're doing, right? We just want the approval, appreciation, um, right? Like the explicit, like you have pleased me and yeah, we'll just do whatever without asking, is this what I want? Is this what I need? Is this what we, yeah, how we want to run our household and yeah, that sounds, that sounds exhausting, but so easy to fall into. Yes, very much so. Very easy. Yeah. Okay. Um, so another twofer, <laughs> what are the short-term and long-term consequences of codependency in new parents? Right. Yeah. When it comes to mm-hmm. each other the baby, their parents. Short-term consequences are probably immediate conflict, disagreeing, uh, feeling disappointed of just not having certain expectations met. And I would say those are definitely short and long-term, but I would say in the immediate moment, when those feelings are there, they are intense, they are raw, they are emotional. Mm -hmm. And it does feel like this short-term consequence can last forever at times. So long-term consequences for new parents can be that patterns are already set, that there is continuous um, disappointment, that expectations aren't being met, that the conflict always continues and erupts further, that the parental unit or the couple unit gets distant. And a lot of people actually do separate during these times because Mm -hmm there isn't the helpful communication about wants, needs, desires, and there are just assumptions. So when those assumptions come in, those can be detrimental to a relationship. If they are not communicated, if they are not expressed, it's hurtful. And it's in such a important time in someone's life of being a new parent, adjusting to an entirely new identity, and then to also lose a partner or feel distant from a partner can have catastrophic catastrophic effects on the relationship and also for the child. So long-term consequences of the codependency really can be the end all be all of the relationship Mm -hmm. if it's not communicated and worked through on a daily basis. Right. And now that I think about it, would you say this is accurate that the long-term consequences can be compounded by the codependency, right? So if I'm, if I'm the husband Mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm all codependent with my mom Mm -hmm. and I'm bringing her, I'm over relying on her to help with taking care of this new baby. I'm taking input and feedback from her and implementing it, even though my wife might not agree. Mm -hmm. My wife is disappointed. She's upset. And, you know, maybe I, um, whether I'm explicit or implicit, I might share some of this with my mom, Mm -hmm. who might just support 
this these ongoing patterns that create more and more distance between me and my wife. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So it's just codependency on codependency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even just thinking about the idea that men used to not be in the delivery room. It was not that long ago that that was the case. And so even if we were to say that the father, the husband's mother is saying, Hey, you shouldn't be in here. You shouldn't be a part of this or yeah, don't be around for that. I've got it. And the wife is, no, I want my husband here. And mother-in-law is trying to impose. It's just going to cause conflict and hurt and pain and different expectations. And husband has always learned to trust his mom. Hopefully he also trusts his wife, but who do you listen to? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There are a lot of generational gaps. Mm -hmm. Right. So how do you help your clients combat their codependency with their parents and in-laws? Talk as much as possible before baby comes mm. about hopes, wishes, desires, expectations for roles, duties, even just play. Like, what do we want to do for our child? Do we want to expose them to television? Do we not? Do we want to have the wood toys only? Are we okay with plastic toys? Are we okay with this kind of toy? Like all these little conversations that seem like they wouldn't be important or not necessary until after the baby is born, but actually are very helpful for before the baby is born, even talking about possible formula and breastfeeding or what the ideas are around that, that the couple unit has their foundation set for their expectations and hopes for their new baby coming. I would highly encourage that first and foremost, and more so with the question of how do we balance it with in-laws or grandparents is that if the couple has this set already, then they can communicate it to the grandparents. Okay. This is our hope. This is what we are doing. This is what the research today is showing us. And this is what we are going to do. So instead of, you know, alcohol on the gums, when the baby is teething, we're going to turn to Tylenol or we're going to try these teethers first. And you need to respect those boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, having some sort of clear communication and conversation that is before the baby arrives, after the baby arrives, and throughout kind of their childhood, because there are also expectations around holiday events and different ideas. So if the couple has an understanding of each other and what they want for their child, it tremendously helps to set these other boundaries because a couple is a unit and a team. They can face the grandparents and say, we are not doing this when the child is at your house. Please make sure that they are not on their stomach. If they are on their stomach, they will not stay at your house again. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and having these clear expectations. Mm -hmm. They are not always comfortable conversations, but they are so necessary. And I believe even with that example of SIDS and laying on your stomach that it's not worth the risk of your child getting hurt rather than the discomfort of having this conversation. Right. Because there are so many parents and grandparents that do not know that SIDS is really a real thing. It just happened every once in a while, or they have this belief, well, you always slept better on your stomach. So that's why I rolled you there. doesn't matter. What are you comfortable with? And also all the doctors and all the nurses in the hospital say, do not do it. Right. So we're going to stick to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So talk as much as possible before the baby comes. And right within that, the question like, how do we balance our needs, wants, preferences, expectations with your parents and my parents? So then there's right clarity, clear understanding. And then it sounds like like step two is share said boundaries with in-laws and grandparents, which that's not an easy conversation. Yeah. Um Right. But then it sounds like too, like a third step is like just really trying to be in touch with like our values, right. And our values are safety. Our values are adherence to 
you know, professional thought on child rearing, Mm -hmm. et cetera, right. To help, I guess, bolster their self-confidence to communicate those said boundaries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I do encourage for clients often is when there is a baby class or CPR class to invite the grandparent to come with. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the baby classes, you just want to be intimate for you and your spouse, but if you do multiple classes or things like that, or the grandparent is going to be a primary caregiver for your child, have them involved. So they get that information that you are also receiving or that you can reference it back. Remember we were taught this. Let's, let's go back to this. You were there. You heard the exact same thing I did. Let's go by the book or Mm -hmm. including them in some sense. It may not be necessary, but sometimes it is just helpful to have them there. They hear it. And even they can remind you if it's something encouraging or appropriate. Right. Mm-hmm. So when it does come to the communication and boundary setting with the grandparents, mm-hmm. I'm curious your thoughts, Jamie, because my husband and I at times like, um, you know, pre children we've been together it'll be 10 years in January and sometimes like I we really both have a boundary yeah I don't I don't think I've delivered any of them I think I've wanted to like Mm -hmm. let me let me tell your parents yes (laughs) and he's like no 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 I'll talk to them (laughs) um and vice versa And Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's like, you know, if, if there's a gathering, my husband really values his, his me time. And so, yeah, I am the one to often say like, oh, you know, he's not coming. And I don't know if that's necessarily, you know, kind of a boundary, but Mm -hmm. I deliver it. He's not like, Hey, Marissa's parents, I'm not going to come. Right. So, um, yeah, when it comes to new parents setting boundaries, like how, how do you encourage that? What do you encourage that conversation to look like? So it goes over it like as, mm-hmm. as possible. I would say whoever you're most comfortable with starting out, like start there. So for me, it's like my mom, I feel like, okay, she's the one that raised me. I have the best connection with her. I can talk to her. Um, and an idea could even be, what do you remember from raising me as a child? Uh, like from early infancy, what is it you remember take me home this this and that and in some sense that builds that connection oh i get to share your birth story and this is exciting okay wonderful i'm glad that happened that way or it seems like that was a totally different time so what my plan is if we were to express like the birth plan my birth plan is x y and z and it's different than what you had when you had me but i want to share with you this is what i hope to happen and i hope that you can support it even though it's different and opens up that conversation, but has already built that rapport in a sense for that conversation. We asked about their interest or their experience. We valued it. And then now we share, this is what we hope to get as well. Um, and it could be as simple as this is the birth plan. This is really what I hope to be. And, you know, there can be conflict on, well, you should take medication. You should do this. Oh, you're going to have, you know, so many opinions, but to have that confidence in yourself before you have these conversations. Okay. This is what I know I want to be true. So I'm going to go to the person I feel most comfortable with to talk about these difficult topics. Right. I'm going to start there and that can just kind of prepare you. So you may have these conversations multiple times, but the more practice, the more confident and comfortable you feel. Mm-hmm. I feel like it's a good example to first make that connection with the grandparent or in-law hear them out, allow them to have that time, value their opinion, because it is important too. There's also some um, information that could be helpful. So I have heard, I I, I apologize, but I believe it's the male that whatever birth weight they were is typically the birth weight of your child um, or around that size. I don't remember if it's male or female, but I want to say it was male. So even just little things like that, there can be some genetic something passed down Um, so that can also be an opportunity to learn a little bit more about something that could happen for you. Um, and then building that connection and then being able to express, this is how I would like to do this. It may be different, but I hope that you can respect it. Right. 
I also feel like there's a piece with grandparents or in-laws when they have multiple children and multiple grandchildren. It could even be, I know that sister-in-law has done it this way and that was great for her family. However, for my family, I would like to do it this way. And even building that communication, but not disrespecting any of the other sibling relationships and how they manage their families, but that is their family. This is our family. We hope that you can respect both sides. We do things a little bit different and that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what if, yeah. So you don't recommend that either partner talks with someone if they're not the most comfortable with them. Right. So if wife in this scenario with the codependent husband, yes. Is she creating the boundary with the grandmother or is it hopefully a mutual decision and the husband is communicating mm -hmm. it? I would say hopefully it is a mutual decision. I wouldn't start with that parent first. I would maybe get a little bit of practice in talking to whoever you felt most comfortable with, but knowing with that husband being the code of having the codependency on the mother really have to get that husband on board with you that you both present as a team. This is what we want. So it doesn't make it sound like, Oh, the wife is a bad one or the wife is making me do this. It's, this is what we want. So not that the wife necessarily has to say it, but that it is presented as parents of this newborn child. This is what we want. And these are the boundaries we are going to set. You cannot come to our house anytime you want. You may come on this designated day, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. option A, set boundary with the parent, or it could be an in-law, but yeah, whoever you're most comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Option B, if, yeah, there is more codependency between a partner and their parent approach as a united front as a team mm -hmm. yeah. so then partner isn't the bad guy yes because yeah it sounds like and um I think yeah I've definitely observed this where the codependent parent will deliver the boundary but yeah they'll say you know it's because of my wife and mm -hmm. it's like oh if only your wife wasn't, we wouldn't mm -hmm. have to do this, right? And then that gets into a triangle and yep. potentially, yeah, potentially creating more disconnect or conflict. Yes. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. Difficult think. conversations, but necessary and important for the long-term goals. Short-term consequences are these conversations that are hard. Long-term goals are being able to communicate, have things the way that you want them and expect them to be and the safety of your children. Because mm -hmm. there are a lot of updates and rules and it's constant. Even a parent myself of three children, there are new things coming out even though I had a child only five years ago. Like that's a thing now? Okay, I didn't know that, but now I know it for my one-year-old. Or they up the um, seatbelt requirements. Okay, you have to be this amount of pounds now. Okay, well, here's another year. Right. So it's just, yeah. it's constant information, but it's important information. And us parents that are in the thick of it are updating ourselves and learning about this and being taught by doctors and other, other forms essentially. And grandparents aren't in it. So they aren't really noticing or keeping up with these changes. Mm -hmm. And last question on this like conversation topic right ideally the there's understanding right mm -hmm. from the grandparent yeah right oh we connected I think that's a great strategy right before you set the boundary so create some type of connection or like ask a story and yeah. have a conversation set the boundary and yeah whether it's you individually or you and your partner how how do you help prepare them for the reality that there might be a refusal or rejection dismissal of mm -hmm. their proposed boundary? It's tough. Um, and definitely happens. 
and it really matters on the strength in the relationship, that foundation that's built and the couple agreeing that this is one of the boundaries that cannot be crossed or this is the end all be all. Um, so let's say sleeping on stomach, be very firm with that. And if it happens, there will be a consequence as in maybe that child will not stay there or sleep there, whatever it may be. Um, but kind of almost preparing, if you know that there's a difficult parent or a parent that is very intrusive and imposing, be prepared. Okay. They may say no, but having that confidence, we communicated it to them. They cannot deny that this was said. So we are going to stay firm in our boundaries. And if they cross them, we will have to think of what that consequence is going to be for ourselves or what distance we need to keep because we know that this is important. Mm -hmm. So if it's something where we say, please don't give our child sugar after 7 p.m. and they give them ice cream at 7.30, okay, maybe we can remind you nicely. <laughs> they will be up all night. Please don't do that. But if it's something much more serious, like sleeping on your stomach and an infant, there has to be those firm, this is unacceptable boundaries. Mm. And having that confidence in the relationship, these are our absolute no's. Okay. We're a team. We will figure this out together if we don't have the support of the parents. Right. And it, it may sound cold, but you have to do what is best for your family unit. Mm -hmm. And hopefully the parents would come around. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's hard because I'm, I'm thinking of some couples I know or like patients I've worked with family members as well. And, um, right. For a couple to have an issue, right. To, or a boundary that they want to set. Mm -hmm you know, we're, we're a team, we're united in this, we deliver said boundary and there's a dismissal on the part of the grandparent, right? Maybe even no room to compromise. And we say, okay, well, yeah, then, you know, baby, baby Sheila can't sleep over for the time being. Um, cause yeah, we don't want her sleeping on her stomach and now potentially the couple has one less caregiver to support them. Mm -hmm. Right. But then again, I'm saying this and then I'm like, okay, yeah. well then just get back in touch with values, like big picture. Yeah. Do we want a night off or do we want the security that our baby girl sleeping on her back and like most likely not going to die in her sleep. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sleep, like the security of her survival. Sleep. Mm -hmm. So yeah, again, just like really having to prioritize those values. And it's not easy and it's an ever changing conversation. Um, I feel like I still talk to my parents and in-laws of just different hopes and expectations we don't want this, but we do want that. Can we try and eliminate this? Let's not expose them to this. Or they got really scared by this. It has to be somewhat of this open communication. And my in-laws and my parents are very active in my children's lives. So mm -hmm. it's almost a weekly, monthly conversation type deal. There are grandparents that live in different states or just, you know, try to FaceTime. That makes it a little bit easier. Um, but still, if there's kind of this consistent exposure, then it has to be expressed. Mm -hmm. And even to the child, well, we do it different in our house. We like it this way. Please tell grandma what the rules are. Yeah. Grandma doesn't know that you're not allowed to jump on the couch, but if you tell her that's great skills for you telling her the rules, and then she's also able to help support you not jumping on the couch. Mm -hmm. Little things. Yeah. Little things, but ensure safety. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I also appreciate you sharing like your experience and also the perspective that, you know, the thing about boundaries, the fantasy is we just set one and somehow that leads to harmony and cohesion in our relationship. Yeah. But boundaries are an ongoing thing because people change, things change. And so if you get practice with setting boundaries early on, 
right? Yeah. Then yeah, that'll just like fortify you and your relationship for the long term since mm-hmm. you're just gonna be revisiting everything monthly. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if not more. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, so last question, right? Uh yeah, what if we go to the comfortable parent by ourselves or we go as a team, we set this boundary. Um, we start to really think critically about our our family and what we want and prioritizing those preferences. Jamie, what are the long-term benefits of making such changes? A healthy, successful family unit. <laughs> Great long-term benefits. Um, of course, that's easy to say as a blanket thing of you will be happy and healthy and that hopefully is the ultimate goal isn't always attainable or there are ebbs and flows in relationships, but to have this communication already set to continuously reset boundaries, reestablish them. It's helpful and builds that cohesion between the couple and also the child that child knows what to expect or that there are similar expectations across all interactions. So if they have rules at sorry for my example rule at my house is you can't be jumping on the couch so when you are at grandma's house you also should not be jumping on her couch it makes sense however grandma doesn't know that that's one of our rules we need to share that grandma's okay with the jumping on the couch i am not so i am telling my children we need to have these rules everywhere and when you're at a friend's house do not jump on the couch please so these are ever-changing conversations that will always be happening And if we start working on them now, even before the child's even born in pregnancy, it's enhancing the communication between the couple, really aligning, decreasing assumption, which is so helpful and being direct and assertive. This is what I would like. Honestly, I'm not sure if my husband cares whether or not the couch is jumped on, but he knows that it matters to me because I have this fear the kid's going to jump off or hit the table and then we're going to go to the ER or whatever it may be. So he helps me enforce no jumping on the couch. He's fine with it. Mm -hmm. But I have this clear communication. This is what I want. He's like, okay, I'll I'll back you up. Great. Mm -hmm. Kids know. Grandparents know. (laughs) This is what we want. And that's an easy example. There are much more difficult conversations, but I feel like this foundation I've even built with my husband, it makes these other situations easier to talk about. So when he doesn't necessarily care about that boundary as much, but he sees that I do, he will support me and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Little things that turn into much bigger things. So long-term goals, long-term successes really are enhancing the relationship and building a good family unit. Also teaching your children how to communicate because you're doing it by example Mm -hmm. and they're having clear expectations and boundaries everywhere that they go. Right. Mm -hmm. Amazing. All right. Well, thank you so much You're for welcome. coming thank on you. to talk about this transition to parenthood. If people want to learn more about you or work with you, what are you offering the listener? We are giving guidance family counseling and we work with the entire family unit and all the multifacets that there are within a family. Uh, we really like to build upon the communication between parents and children, parents understanding their children and their young developmental minds, or even their adolescent minds that are sometimes challenging. So you can find us at givenguidance.com. That is our website and our business is Given Guidance Family Counseling. If you do reference this podcast, we'd be happy to give you $10 off your first session. And we do have some social media platforms. However, we are not very active on them right now, maybe in the future but you can find us on Google, on Yelp, and givenguidance.com. That is the best way to reach us or our business line. Uh, If you would like to call for a free consultation, see what therapists might match with you best, our number is 818-446-7488. Awesome. I will put links to all of that in the show notes. And again, thank you for coming on. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Dear listener, thank you for listening. And I hope you have a great week. And I will see you next week. 
Hey girl, it's Marissa again. I'm not like a regular podcaster, I'm a cool podcaster, right? Thank you for listening and staying till the end. You can find me on Instagram at Therapy with Marissa. Email me, Marissa at codependummy.com. Check out codependummy.com for more information on the show. And baby girl, a subscribe, rating, and review would be much appreciated. Till next time, I want you to remember, if you are feeling unseen, I see you. If you are feeling unheard, I hear you. And if you think that you don't matter, know that you matter to me. I want you to go out there so you can stop playing small and start taking up space, you dummy. And now, the disclaimer. Girl, this is not therapy and I am not your therapist. This podcast is designed to provide accurate and authoritative information in regards to the subject matter covered. It is given with the understanding that neither the host, publisher, or guests are rendering any legal, clinical, or other professional service. If you want or need a professional, please find one.